So if you're a, a guest today, my name's Jeremy. I'm one of the pastors here at Riding the River. Uh, you know, my, my wife just had a baby, so she's not here today. She's, yeah, keeping the, the little one at home to keep it safe. So this morning we gathered up on the back porch and did a little Bible study at the house. And I just want to share a part of it before we pray. Uh, this is not the message for the day, but God really spoke to me on that back porch this morning, and I had to share it. So we, we were in Ephesians 6, and we were talking about the whole armor of God and putting on the armor of God, something that we all need to be thinking about daily right now with everything that's going on in our country. But if you're a pastor of a church, man, Sunday mornings, you can kind of get beat up coming in because you're kind of the pack mule. You pack a lot of things around for other people. Kim knows what I'm talking about. Uh, so I always pray for that full armor of God. And most of you that have been in the Bible for a while have probably heard it. But the full armor of God, it starts in 610 and goes, goes through 18. And that's usually where we stop reading. But this morning I kept reading and it, and it spoke to me. So in verse 19, this is Paul speaking. And he says, and pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So I pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. Amen. Let's pray, guys. Father God, I, I pray that prayer for myself. I, I'm going to be selfish this morning. Give me the words to say that if there's somebody in here that is seeking, that is lost, that is just wondering what's next, what else is out there? that you pour it out on them, Lord. I pray that you pour out your spirit on us right now, that you feel this space that we are bursting at the seams so that people that have never known your presence, they leave here today knowing that there is a God in this land. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I'm going to do a little social experiment this morning. Anybody want to be a part of my social experiment? Uh, <laughs> Kim's like, no. You're not, you won't get dirty or nothing. I'm, I got to preach to this side too. Tracy's always getting after me, but you swap sides, so you're going to miss out today. All right, all right. So I'm going to put up some pictures, and you guys just be audible, just first thing that comes to you. All right, can I get that first picture? Oh. All right, what about that next one? Pretty, pretty cute, right? Not my kids. Uh, now, unless you're like a hardcore cowboy, you're like, Dad, give him another mouth to feed, not the baby, the dog. Uh, that's what my dad would have said. All right, so here's one for the cowboys. Put another one up there. Oh, man, some little working dog puppies, right? So just, you know, oh, man, warm, fuzzy. Was anybody like, oh, God, puppies? Any? Type, maybe. All right, what about this one? This is for you guys. That ain't, that ain't cool. What about the next one? Gets, gets a little bit worse. Nobody wants to see a snake with a kid. What about the next one? Yeah. So, did you, do you hear the difference? Is, is there anybody that was like, oh, man, look at that snake, a Burmese python? No, nobody, right? So even if you're, like, I'm not one of those people that's, like, deathly afraid of snakes. Like, I'll grab a snake, I'll pick it up, but I don't, I don't look at them the way I do puppies. I don't want one in my house. Uh, the way this message started is uh, my little boy, Yancey, he's been hanging out with me, like, sun up till sun down because I'm trying to give mama a break because let me give you guys some free advice. Having a newborn and a toddler at the same time is not a great idea. So, so, yeah, the Fitzpatricks, no. Uh, I'm learning from, from their mistakes. <laughs> hey, mine will be like a mass exodus. They'll all leave at the same time. Yeah, two to go for him. You keep him in your prayers. But Yancey and I, the other day as we're working, I had to do some welding. Well, I've got two welders at the, at the ranch. I got a little one I keep up at the working barn and a big one that's down at the hay barn, and I needed that big one. So we go down there, and we're bebopping along, and I ain't used that welder in a while, so it wouldn't start. The battery's dead. So just, I'm in autopilot, man. I pop the top and go to stick my hand in there. Biggest daggum chicken snake I ever seen in my life. I jumped 10 feet off the ground, and y Yancey just stopped mid-sentence and was like, what, Dad? I said, there's, there's, you know, got my composure. There's a big old snake in there. And he said, shoot it. I said, I... 
I can't shoot it. It's on top of the welder. We've got to have that welder. But Yancey, I've never had a conversation with him about, like, hey, if you see a snake, run. I have now. Uh, but, like, you know, usually we've been around water snakes. We live in the hill country where there's not that many rattlers. But even when he saw them water snakes for the first time, he's like, Dad, shoot them. Shoot them. Actually, still, you came over one time right after I shot one, and Yancey was walking around with it. Uh, so instinctively, most of us, we just, we don't like snakes, right? Like, even if you're a Steve Irwin, where you're like, oh, look at him, mate, you know? Like, you had to develop that. You had to study on them, you know? Like, I think they're cool and fascinating, but I don't want to sleep with them. I don't want to cuddle up with them. So what if I told you that that's in you naturally because God said so? Because God said so. So uh, the, today's message is about being in God's design. I'm going to be in Genesis for pretty much all of the message today, but I want to read to you from Genesis 3 so that we can establish a baseline about this hatred of snakes, this fear of snakes, because it ties into everything else I'm going to go through. 3.14, it says, Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, and what he did is he tempted, or he got Eve to buy into the lie that she should eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We're going to go into that. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly. That's how we know it's a snake. Now, I don't, maybe he had legs in the Garden of Eden. I don't know. God took them away that day. He says, groveling in the dust as long as you live. Now, here's the important part. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between, and between your offspring and her offspring, which would be us. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel, thus saith the Lord. It is in your DNA to have a fear of snakes because, guess what? God said so. So let me ask you growing up, did, how many of you guys ever heard, because I said so, from your mom or daddy? Man, I heard it all the time, if you guys can believe that or not. Uh, so... Man, it, you know, having Yancey with me again, I started thinking back to, like, when I was a kid with my dad, and my dad was such a great teacher. Uh, he would take his time, and he would explain everything he was doing, even though I didn't care. You know what I mean? He was gentle with me. And I find myself doing that with Yancey. Like, yesterday, my hands are dirty because there's PVC glue all over them. It's all in Yancey's hair. I'll get to that later. <laughs> But we were plumbing up a well house yesterday, and, you know, I could have gone a lot faster if he wouldn't be there. It wouldn't have been there. But everything I did, I was explaining it to him. I was, and then I'd start questioning him, what is this called? And he'd say, the purple stuff. And I'd say, it's the primer. Why do we use the primer? And then we'd use the glue. And then he wanted to do a piece, so I let him do a piece that didn't matter. Uh, but there is times when Yancey's doing things, and I'm like, Yancey, don't do that. And he always says... Well, why, Dad? Because that's what I would say. Why, Dad? And in the heat of the moment, you're like, because I said so. Now, generally, when we say that to our kids, is it because we're being mean? No, they're about to do something that's going to get them in a whole lot of trouble. And you don't have time to stop and explain why they shouldn't do X, Y, Z. You say, because I said so. And we'll talk about it later. Sometimes God, he puts things in us. And it's there because he said so. Romans 1.20, I want to read to you. This is one of my favorite verses from Romans. It says, For every since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Everything God made, they clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Let me cowboy that up so you can understand it, because that's a lot. It says, all you got to do is throw your head up and look around, and you'll know there's a God. You will know that there's a God. So I've, that, that speaks to me. I've always said, you know, how lucky we are, people that work in agriculture, you guys that make your living outside, is you get to be in God's design all day long. Like seeing a, a new calf born or an aggravating, stinking goat that runs off for three days, and you ride it off as dead, and then it shows up with a new baby, and you're more excited over a goat than you ever thought you could be. God's design. We get to see it. We have no excuse for not knowing that there is a God. There's some things that he made about us. When, when Jeff first asked me to take on full-time ministry, 
you know, I prayed about it, I thought about it, and I thought, well, what is that thing that is going to define my ministry? What is going to be that, that base for me that if I ever feel myself wandering from it that I'm going to come back to? So I started thinking about, like, the way God made me, the things that I find delight in, and it's being out. It's being in nature. And I have to be careful, you know, because sometimes that can almost be like nature worship, which is a danger that's mentioned in the Bible. But I decided that my ministry would be about God's design, being in God's design. I pray every day, thank you for allowing me to work in your design. Bless my hands to that work. Help me to minister to others because I get to be in your design all day long. In Revelations, at the end, it says he's going to shake the world and everything man made is going to crumble. And the only thing that will be left is what he made. And I'm lucky enough that I get to enjoy it now, that I get to see it now. God's design, what are some of the things that are the way they are because he said so? So we have to go to the beginning. We have to go to Genesis. If you have a Bible, follow along, take notes. You go back and you read this stuff for yourself. I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole book of Genesis this morning, I promise. Uh, but I want to hit some high points. So Genesis 1 is the story of God creating the heavens and the earth and everything in them, including man, right? Adam and Eve. Now, most of us that have grown up into the church, or maybe you're a young Christian, or maybe you're somebody that's just starting to read the Bible, when you think of Genesis, what do you think of? Adam and Eve, I heard it. Man, guilty, that's what I think of, Adam and Eve. The story of Genesis is about Adam and Eve. Here's the deal, guys. The story of Genesis is not about Adam and Eve. The story of Genesis is about God. It's about God. And we don't like that because it ain't about me. It ain't about Jeremy. It ain't about great-grandpappy Adam that I came from. The story of Genesis is about God. Now, I work with a lot of young people, but this goes for older people, too. We're all looking for a meaning, right? The meaning of life. What is our purpose here? We're looking for a meaning, a purpose, a calling. If you want to be a Navy SEAL like Tate, you're looking for that challenge. Because I've been there, man. I wanted that challenge. And we think if we find those things, it'll be the most fulfilling thing ever. And our life will be complete. Our life will be whole. All those things will be met. So let me ask you a question. If your life was a movie... Who's the main character? Is it you? I know most of my life I was the main character in mine because I didn't care who I stepped on or who I had to claw over. I was the main character. Is it your family? Is it your wife? Is it your kids? Is it a mentor that you've put up on a pedestal? Who's the main character of your life if it was a story? Because if it's any of those, if it's anything but God, it's wrong. Our story, the main character, is God. Uh, we were designed, God made us, to play a supporting role. Genesis 1, it reads like poetry. It says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. There was light because God said so. Then God said in 126, if you're following along, read that. He says, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. God said, let us make human beings to be like us. Well, who's us? That's what kids ask me all the time as they're getting into the Word. It's us. The simple answer is it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's the three-in-one package. It's awesome. I'm going to get into that more later towards the end, and we're going to look at that again. But us was the Godhead, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He created us out of an overflow of His beauty, of his perfectness, of his love, and his design was for us to share in it. His design for us was to share in his beauty, his love. When we read the story of Adam and Eve, the center of their life was God. God was the center of their life. So let me tell you this. If you want to know purpose, if you want to be challenged, do you want to know what your calling is? You will never know, you will never be fulfilled until you make God the center of your life. That is a truth, that is a fact, that is something you can take to the bank. Never, and whatever you try to do, 
that, that's outside of his design. Like if you're in a, a marriage where God is not the center, if you have it, where are you laughing at? If you've got a business where God is not the center, whatever it is that you're not putting God in the center of, man, it's never good. It always struggles. It always needs help. It always needs looking after. Uh, here's what we do, though. Sin creeps in. And I'm talking about the kind of sin that self-indulgent nature where it's all about me and it ain't about him. We put something else at the center of our life. A relationship, uh, uh, money, a lifestyle that we're pursuing. In Genesis 3, 4, the serpent convinced Eve that the fruit was good. He tells her, ah, surely you won't die if you try it. He says, you'll be like God. Just take your bite of that. And that sounded pretty good to Eve. Be like God? I, I got to have some of that. Side note for, for men. Side note for men. Who gets the blame for eating that fruit? Eve, right? If you'll just back up to Genesis 2.15, God told Adam not to eat that fruit. And that was before woman had ever even been made. It was the very next line that he made. So men, are you communicating with your wives? Those divine revelations you're picking up as you read the Bible, are you pouring that stuff out on your other half? That's a whole new other message, but God kind of threw that on my plate. That's for like a men's retreat or something. Uh, so back to, back to Genesis 3-4. The, ser- the serpent convinced Eve that the fruit was good, she wouldn't die, and she would be like God. So she took it, she gave it to her husband. God was not the center of her life anymore. That fruit, being like God, had became the center of their life. So the question today is, what has Satan, what has the world, what has Facebook, what has counterculture convinced you to put at the center of your life over God? Because, man, we all, we all do it. We all stray. We all fall short. Sometimes we've got to put ourselves in check. Uh... How many little ones are in here? Okay, not too many. Good. That always means it's going somewhere. (laughs) Oh, you'll be good. Mom will explain it to you. So I work with a lot of teens. Do you know what's at the center of a teen's life? And it's something we don't talk about a whole lot anymore. It's romantic love. It is the great S-E-X. I mean, boys haven't changed much. They are like a Black Eyed Peas song. I got to get that. It, it, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to sing I'm not as good as Grady. But, but girls have gotten, honestly, I looked up some stats, and they call it, it says like the average from 8th grade to 12th grade, a girl will go without a boyfriend is about three days. They call them serial daters. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's scary. We laugh at that, but that's kind of scary. So like in my day, the way they used to try to convince us to not do that is we, they showed us lots of pictures of STDs, like pretty grotesque pictures, and it worked for like five minutes. <laughs> what they should have done was like printed out like a card size uh, wallet insert with those pictures. What I think I'm going to do to my son when he goes on dates is he's got to wear one of them pictures on his forehead, and I'll make her put one on hers. So <laughs> that's what they got to look at is those pictures. But that didn't, that didn't work. And we go to extremes, you know, like then don't do it at all, parts will fall off. (laughs) And and now, now we don't even talk about it because there's so much worse stuff. I mean, I'm being serious. Like there's some parents that are allowing it to happen in the house because they think it's better for them to be doing it there safely than somewhere else. Are you kidding me? And I, man, I, so I get calls a lot. My older daughter, Vivi, is kind of like my secretary. So, like, when we're out working on the ranch, my phone is always in the truck. It's always on the side-by-side, and she kind of screens my calls. It starts ringing, and she's like, hey, it's so-and-so, and and I'm either like, I'll take it or I'll call them back. And so, true story, uh, I don't want to tell the names. It's nobody that goes to church here. Uh, But a call came in, and she said, hey, it's so-and-so, and I was like, why are they calling? And then I was like, okay, somebody's either dead or somebody's pregnant. So I answered the phone, and it's a grandma that has custody of her, her grandkid, 15-year-old girl that's pregnant by a 14-year-old boy. 
and instantly, you know, well, we tried to get an abortion, and uh, it's too far now. She lied about that, blah, blah. So I had to talk to him how that's a horrible idea. That's way outside God's design. And, and just pray with them. But the thing is, is like, I saw this coming because they weren't talking about it. They were allowing it to go on. You know, I'm just a youth pastor. I can do so much. But guys, we got to quit going from extremes with our young people. So let me ask you a question. Is a fire in your house good? Depends on where it is, right? If it's cold outside and you come in chilled to the bone and there's a good fire going in the fireplace, oh, man, got to get that. But if it's in your kitchen while your wife is learning how to can stuff, and the pressure cooker is lodged in the ceiling and the hood's sparking and the curtains are on fire? That didn't happen, but I could see that happening. That's not a good place to have a fire in your house. Here's what I wish somebody would have told me when I was young, and I'm telling all you guys sitting up there. Yeah, you're going to get your heart broke a couple of times, I hope, because you need to go through that. But stay strong, stay the course, because one day you're going to meet that person and you're going to wish it was the only one you would have ever kissed. You're going to wish it was the only one you'd ever given your whole self to. Now, you're still going to love each other deeply, and if God is at the center, it's going to be blessed. But you can't take that back once you give it away. All I got to say. <clears throat> Genesis 1.27 so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. What does that mean? Does that mean we just look like God? Because if I like have a picture of God in my head, it don't look like me. It looks more like Grady. <laughs> <laughs> Moses, yeah. Well, Moses, I think, kind of looked like God too, probably. But we've gotten a long ways from that. Does that mean we just look like him? Because think about this, guys. It's everything he made. If you go back into one, he, he would make something, and he would say, it is good. He never said, it's perfect, it's finished. He said, I made it, it's, it's good. So I started thinking about that, probably more than I should, but I told you guys how my, my brain works. So I started thinking about my wife, man, on Sunday mornings. I usually get to church like an hour before her because I got to do stuff. I got to pray with people. Uh, so I'm always on the lookout for when she comes in. And when I see her come in, oh, man, it's almost like I quit whatever I'm talking to, and she goes into slow motion. And I start hearing that old song, boom, boom, oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> she, she, she looks good. And uh, she's got on just the right amount of makeup, not too much, you know, just a little to uh, enhance her natural beauty. And I love it when she wears them glasses because she's got like that geeky, nerdy cuteness deal going on. <laughs> but sometimes I just sit there and I'm like, man, she is perfect. In the mornings when she wakes up to a crying baby, she's good. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? She's not here today, so I can get away telling that. God made us in his image, and he put us in a garden. Not to be park rangers, not to preserve and protect it, but to cultivate it, to co-create with him. Genesis 2.5, it says he needed people to cultivate the land. He put us there to be gardeners, to improve what is good, and to co-create. So let me tell you this. If you want to be in the image of God, do something that glorifies him that benefits somebody besides yourself. Because as we say all the time out here, it ain't about me, it is all about him. That is being in God's design. Uh, what did God make you to do? You know, what did he make you to do? Anybody ever seen the movie Chariots of Fire? It's an old movie. I thought I had discovered it on YouTube. But I was talking to Jeff about it, and he was like, oh, yeah, man, that's a great movie. Well, you have a lot of people that like that. And I was like, yeah, people your age probably, but not people my age probably never heard of it. Uh, just kidding. Kim, I know you're much younger than him. <laughs> Chariots of Fire, it's a great, it came out like in the 70s, but it, it's about a guy named Eric Little that was a Scottish Olympic athlete 
but his whole fa- he was a devout Christian too, man, very devout. Uh, his whole family, they were missionaries in China, and he felt a calling to go do that. He wanted to be a missionary. He wanted to take the gospel to people that had never heard it, but he got selected to run in the Olympics, and he decided to do it, and his whole family, man, they were, they were confused. They're like, why do you want to do that? We have this mission set before us from God. And there's a part in the movie where he's talking to his sister, and she can't understand. And this is what he, this isn't a direct quote. I kind of just went with it. But uh, uh, he says, God has made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. God has given you something to do. What I'm asking you is, are you doing it for his mission? Are you doing it to impact the kingdom? Or is it all about you? All right, last point. So as much as we get up here every Sunday and we talk about how you are not too far gone, you, there's nothing you could do that could keep you from coming to the cross. I still get phone calls. I talked to two fine young men this week. that They're, they're struggling with that. Man, I'm too far gone. I'm too messed up. I'm not worthy. Listen to this. Write this down. Burn this in your mind. Put it on your heart. Only God who brought life out of nothing can bring life back from the dead. Only God who brought life out of nothing, life out of nothing, can bring life back from the dead. Genesis 1-2, the earth was formless. It was empty. It was dark. It says that. God spoke it into existence because he said so. The earth came to exist and everything in it. Uh, Genesis 2, 7, God formed man from dust of the ground. So not even like good soil, not like miracle Grow soil that you get at Home Depot. Like dust, like the not good stuff. He formed man out of nothing, guys, because he said so, we exist. And then we read not farther along than that than, G- than in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve are discovered in sin. They were naked. They knew they were naked, and they hid from God. Now, here's where we get it confused. God still showed up in the garden looking for them. God wasn't hiding from them because of something they had done. They were hiding from God because of something they had done. They were hiding from God. So only God who brought life out of nothing can bring life back from the dead death had to enter the world because of sin in 321 there's the first death in the whole bible god killed an animal killed an animal and made clothes out of it so that they wouldn't be naked anymore death entered the world because of sin not just the physical but the need for blood to cover sin so maybe today you feel like you are not good enough that you've done too much stop hiding from god and i don't want to hear that cop out anymore stop hiding from God. Maybe you got some bad things you've done and you, you, you need that blood for the sin. Guess what? It's already been poured out. It's already been poured out. All you got to do is accept it. All you got to do is acknowledge that blood's been poured out. With all the doom and gloom that we go on to read in Genesis about the fall of man and then the flood and then a couple of cities being destroyed and on and on and on, people being oppressed, all that doom and gloom. Guess what? There's another because God said so. He made a promise. He made a promise amongst all that going on. The promise was that one day he'd send somebody to defeat death, to make us new, to restore us, to get us back to his design, to be an overflow of his love and to share in it, to share in it. If you got a Bible, flip to first to, to John, John one, not first John, but to John one. So when we read there in Genesis, it says, "In the beginning, in the beginning." What I love about John one, I want to read this to you. One, one one through five. It says, "In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing." was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created. 
and his life brought light to everyone. You think you're too far gone? Listen to this. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Who's John talking about? Who is that from 126 in the beginning? Genesis 126. Let us create man in our image. Man, it's Jesus. It's the word, the light is Jesus. The way, the truth, the life is Jesus. The only way to God is through Jesus. It ain't through self-reflection. It ain't through levitating or meditating or hula hooping. Man, it's Jesus. He's got to be the center. He's got to be the center. Man, last little quick story. You know all this crazy weather we've been having lately? Has anybody like looked into that, why that's happening? It's because the earth is actually turning a little bit on its axis. I, that's kind of scary to me. That's more scary than all the rights and stuff going on. So you think about the earth, you think about the universe, the solar system, another thing that God created that is the way it is because God said so. Dude, the earth is perfectly situated from the sun to thrive. I mean, perfect. A little bit closer, no good. A little bit farther away, no good. I can't believe that's just by chance. And it got the sun at the center. Now, what if the earth decided, you know, I'm going to go do my own thing? What would happen? Well, if it went too close, it would burn up. If it went the other way, it would freeze, freeze up. You can't. You can't do it. When you take God out of the center of your life, you can't do it. You can't do it. Maybe you've known him for a long time, man. Maybe, maybe you've known Jesus. You prayed that prayer a long time ago, and you're good. Man, you're in your Bible. You're at church. That's awesome. God bless you. Still told me about spiritual constipation this morning. It's when you're taking it all in, but nothing's coming out. What, what's coming out? <laughs> I told you I'd get poop in every sermon. I didn't have it in this one. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe, you don't, maybe you don't know him. Maybe you're here seeking. Or maybe, maybe you think you do, but today you're starting to question things because you know there are some areas where you're outside his design. Does Jesus know you? Do you want to get back in his design? Man, it's, so, it's already been poured out. It is done. He says, it is finished. All you got to do is stand up and raise your hand and say, here I am, and pray. Pray a simple prayer like this. Father God, we love you. I pray that if there's anybody in here right now, Lord, that is hurting, that, that needs you desperately, or they just want to know more, and they're feeling your presence today, that they might pray a prayer just like this right where they're sitting. Lord, I am a sinner, but I believe you sent Jesus. You sent him not, not only for everybody else, for all the good people, but you sent him for me. And I believe that he is who he said he was. I believe that he is who you say he is. I believe that he walked this earth and he was blameless. I believe that he was crucified. He was nailed to the cross. That his blood was poured out for me. And I believe that he defeated death. And I believe he's coming back again. And Lord, I'm asking you right now, come and dwell in me. Clean me up and get me ready for when he comes back. Because I believe Work on me, Lord. Father, I thank you for this body of believers, the way you've gathered us up out here and you've poured your spirit out on us. Now, I feel your presence, Lord, and I know you're on the move and you are working amongst us. I pray you be with our country as we're entering some difficult times. But just like this message this morning, when we say anytime God is not the center, things fall apart. This country was built with you as the center. You are the center, Lord, the center of our lives, the center of our country, the foundations of this nation, the things that made us great because you were right there. And now we've taken you out. We've taken you out of everything. Lord, I pray that you get us back there. And I, I'm not only praying for President Trump. It's easy to pray for President Trump. I'm praying for Nancy Pelosi, Lord. 
I'm, I'm praying that you break her and put her on her knees before your throne so that she's got nowhere to go but to you, Father. Lord, heal us as a nation. Help everybody that leaves these doors today to realize they're entering a mission field and help them to be bold for you, Lord. And help me. Help me to strengthen them. Help me to be there for them. And help me to come a-running when you call. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lay pastors, elders, come to the front. If you need somebody to pray with you, come see one of these guys. I'll stay up here as long as I can, but I got to go to a camp meeting pretty soon. So God bless you. I hope I see you Wednesday.